So without further ado, I'll give the word to the first presenter, and that is a great honor to present uh, Professor Mihaina Thea from Radboud University in the Netherlands, who will be known to most of you as the father of trained innate immunity. Mihai was the very first to write a protocol to test the effect of BCG against COVID-19, a protocol that he generously shared and that many of us subsequently used as a, a starting point for our own trials. And Mihai will be presenting the results of the Dutch COVID-19 trials today. Welcome, Mihai. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Christina. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be together with you uh, today and to be able to share with you some of our uh, uh, data in the last uh, two years uh, or so. So I will immediately share my screen. So I, I hope that everybody is able to uh, to see my screen in yeah. which, in which oh, great, in which I would like to to, sh to discuss with you what have we learned from, from COVID-19 trials in the Netherlands in the, in, the last, uh, in the last two years or so. And first of all, I would like to just very briefly, just as an introduction, I'm also the first, uh, the first uh, uh, presenter today, just to introduce very briefly, why did we do that? And this is a, this is a slide uh, that was very generously shared actually by, by Peter and Christina some, some years ago, and I'm very often using it. Uh, showing that when BCG started to be introduced in various countries around the world, and this is a, the example of Sweden, uh, people have observed actually that uh, uh, all-cause mortality was very strongly decreasing and much more than that can be explained by TB death alone. This is, this is in children between zero and uh, four years of age uh, who were receiving BCG in the time before antibiotics with mortality decreasing from 11 to 4% whereas the TB deaths were responsible uh, for less than 1% of the deaths. So this, this has, uh, has been observed many times that BCG was introduced in various uh, countries. It was beautifully thereafter showed in clinical trials by, uh, by Peter and Christina in, in West Africa. And we try to understand what is the mechanism behind it. And what we have seen basically is that there are changes in the chromatin architecture in the progenitors of innate immune cells, such as uh, monocytes, macrophages, also uh, granulocytes by that matter, in which, uh, in which um, uh, the, the chemical changes, the histone modification that take place during an activation of the innate immune cells in an infection, such as phosphorylation, methylation, acetylation, that, that opens the chromatin enabling gene transcription are not completely lost after the first infection or vaccination is eliminated. And some of these uh, chemical changes, especially methylation of histones remain as a sort of bookmarks um, uh, at the sites in the, in, in the DNA that are important for host defense. So the next time that an infection takes place, uh, the chromatin architecture changes, the gene transcription can be induced much quicker. It's like putting a bookmark and the next time knowing exactly where, where to open the book because the bookmark is, is at the right place. So we have shown that uh, previously and that enables the immune cells and in our case, innate immune cells in an antigen independent manner to respond better to a second infection because these bookmarks are at the place which are necessary for host defense and they are activated easier the second time. So we have, uh, we have shown that uh, this uh, happening. And in the last year or so, actually uh, two years or so, we have worked to try to understand which are the transcriptional immune responses at the level of individual monocyte subpopulations during uh, during this activation of these processes. So for example, we took and purified human monocytes, we exposed them ex vivo to BCG uh, for 24 hours, then we washed them, and then we re-stimulated them with LPS uh, at, um, uh, on day six, and assess at single cell level with single cell RNA sequencing, the programs in various cell populations. And in a moment, I will, I will come back to show you why is this important for COVID-19. And we identified basically uh, three types of, uh, of cells. Some of these cells are, uh, are responding just as good before as after the BCG. So it is no change, in the, no change induced by the BCG, approximately 25 to 30% of the cells. And, and we call them non-trainable. They respond, they are perfectly active, but they do not respond better the second time 
after the BCG vaccination. Then we had cells, approximately 25% again, which produce much better chemokines upon re-stimulation after BCG exposure. So we call them monocyte, monocytes producing chemokines. And then we have cells that were much broader able to, uh, to induce uh, um, uh, proteins, cytokines that are important for host defense, including chemokines, but also pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as R1, beta, R6, TNF, and so on. So upon a first exposure to BCG, they start to respond much better to, to many other uh, components of the inflammatory response, and we call them monocytes producing chemokines and inflammatory cytokines. So we described these, and we were able thereafter to identify the transcriptional the transcriptional programs that are characterizing the MC and the MCI trained immunity uh, programs. And why is this important? Because thereafter, we took, uh, we took databases published in the literature on the single cell sequencing in patients with mild and severe COVID, and we assessed where these trained immunity transcriptional programs can be induced properly in patients with mild or severe, uh, severe COVID-19. And what we have observed is that indeed in two independent cohorts that were published independently of us, this was just published in, in cell uh, by a consortium of colleagues from Germany. And, and we just analyzing in silico the uh, training immunity transcriptional programs, we observed that patients with a mild uh, COVID-19, they express very well uh, both MC and MCI, and especially MCI uh, transcriptional programs, as you can see here in both uh, the two cohorts, whereas the severe patients, the patients that developed a, a, a critical illness uh, because of COVID-19, were not able to upregulate uh, their trained immunity transcriptional programs, and especially uh, MCI but also MC. So putting all this information together, we come to the, to the concept that uh, if someone has a high innate immune response in the beginning, it can downregulate uh, the, the, uh, uh, the virus multiplication, leading to low viremia in the circulation, low uh, inflammatory systemic, inf uh, low systemic inflammation, low symptoms, and survival. If someone, however, would have very low innate immune responses in the beginning, when that person doesn't even know that they were infected, but that would allow uh, the virus to, mul uh, to multiply. They would get high viremia, high, uh, um, high systemic inflammation, high severity, and unfortunately, some people would die. So the question for us, would it be possible to improve this innate immune responses by BCG vaccination and in such a way protect also against, uh, against respiratory tract infections in general and COVID-19 in particular in, 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 in the case of the pandemic. In the first two slides, I will just very briefly mention because we started that already before the pandemic and, and uh, Evangelos uh, Gamarelos, uh, our collaborator for University of Athens will probably present these studies in much more uh, detail after my talk. But just to mention that we started this already together with him before the pandemic. These are data of the ACTIVATE study in which uh, elderly at high risk of infections were, uh, were randomized to receive uh, either placebo or BCG, and we followed them up for one year, and we observed indeed 40% uh, less, uh, less infections in these. And then uh, we did uh, precisely the same together with him, but again, he will present that in more detail in Activate 2 study of BCG vaccination in elderly. Revaccination, I have to say, because the vast majority of the people in, uh, in uh, Greece of this age were vaccinated with BCG at birth, and BCG revaccination seemed to, uh, to decrease also uh, the number of infections uh, in, uh, in this population. Now, going, uh, going to the Netherlands, having all this knowledge uh, at that moment, we thought at the beginning of, uh, of the pandemic, when, when we didn't have yet other types of vaccines, would, it be able, would we be able to obtain even a partial protection of a, against uh, COVID-19? And we performed three trials, actually, and I will show two of, the, uh, two of them, uh, the two largest ones, in which, uh, in which we uh, perform randomization of, uh, of uh, populations of individuals to placebo and BCG. So this is the BCG Corona elderly study. 
in which uh, 2,000 uh, uh, volunteers above the age of uh, 60 were uh, were included, and they were randomized to receive either a placebo or a, a, a vaccination uh, or a BCG vaccination, and uh, and they were followed uh, thereafter for uh, uh, for six months. At the end of the study, because this was done very quickly after the start of the pandemic, already we started in uh, March April uh, 2020, and we didn't have the chance at that moment to to take all, also blood for. Uh, for immunological uh, assessments in the very beginning, but we did that at the end of the study, and I will show you some data at the end of the study regarding that. And in this population of, uh, of uh, Dutch Northern Europeans, basically, who did not receive uh, BCG vaccination at birth, so this is the first uh, vaccination that the majority of the, of the individuals had, we were not able to see a difference in clinically relevant uh, respiratory tract infections or SARS-CoV-2 total number of infections. As you can see here, uh, no difference whatsoever between the two population in the total incidence of infections. On the other hand, we also looked at the end of the study, as I mentioned to you, um, on, on the cellular and serological responses of these individuals um, um, upon stimulation with influenza and SARS-CoV-2. And why did we do that? Because we were interested to see, well, first of all, severity of the disease, but we did not have uh, enough uh, information about that because the trial was, was too small, basically. We had, I think, only, if I remember correctly, three uh, of our individuals ended up in the hospital, two in the uh, in the placebo group and one in the in the BCG. But of course, you cannot do a statistics based on on three individuals. Uh, but we wanted to see whether at least the the immunological responses are are improved upon BCG vaccination. And these these are cells that were isolated at the end of the study from individuals either receiving placebo or BCG and re-stimulated with influenza and SARS-CoV-2. And very interestingly. What we have seen indeed that that people vaccinated with BCG they responded better to stimulation with uh, uh, with influenza at at several uh, cytokine level R1 beta L6 TNF, but interestingly this response was slightly increased for L6 in case of uh, of SARS-CoV-2 but not other uh, but not other cytokines so it seems that. Uh, that BCG was inducing a better cellular response against influenza than SARS-CoV-2. And this is important uh, to keep in mind. At the same time, we looked uh, at the serological response in individuals who were diagnosed with the COVID-19 in the end. So the numbers were similar, but then we took cells from these individuals who were diagnosed with, uh, with uh, COVID-19 and we assessed the serological response. And if the people got BCG, what we have observed that uh, that uh, there were clear uh, uh, differences, especially for S protein RBD, uh, was significantly increased uh, um, um, uh, titers of antibodies against M protein, also uh, a little bit, but but the numbers were too small, uh, probably. Uh, very important, but uh, 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 and we are doing these studies now. We don't have yet the data. Uh, to see whether, uh, whether BCG improved the response also to vaccination, because in the meantime, many of our volunteers, the vast majority, of course, received also uh, COVID-19 uh, specific vaccines, and we are now busy to try to see whether there is an improvement of the response. But in between, there was another study in Mexico, which actually did precisely that. Uh, they did in two groups of individuals, uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccination, uh, but in one bef uh, beforehand, they received placebo. In another group, they received BCG, and the BCG vaccinated individuals also seem, again, a um, uh, better serological response in line with what we have observed in the individuals we were, who were diagnosed with the disease. This was the first study that I wanted to present you. Then we performed uh, in parallel, basically uh, almost in parallel, uh, a second study. We started a little bit later. This was started in the summer of 2020 in a larger uh, group of individuals, also elderly, also above 60 years of, of age, but now with comorbidities. The other ones were healthy uh, elderly. These were individuals with at least one comorbidity. 
uh, lung disease, for example, COPD or cardiovascular disease and so on. And why did, were we interested in this group? Because this group is more, uh, more susceptible to the disease and the severity is higher. Because in the other group, as I mentioned to you, there were no deaths, fortunately, but also very little severe disease. So we could not say anything about the severity of the disease. And now uh, we did another study in 6,000 individuals. This is BCG prime study. And we, again, first of all, we looked at the cumulative incidence of all infections, all COVID-19, and we have not seen anything. Again, precisely the same, very neatly validating basically the conclusion that the total number, the incidence, the total number of, of COVID-19 infections was not different. How about now about some measures of, of, um, of severity? In the first six months of the study, unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, fortunately, we don't have uh, a lot of a very severe cases, but still much more than in the other ones. And what we have observed in, in the first six months, and now we are following them up for another year, basically, and, and in the summer, we will know what is happening after one and a half years, because this is just what, what was happening in the, um, uh, during uh, during the second wave of the uh, of the pandemic, but now also the the third and the fourth will be assessed basically. But what we have seen is a is a fifteen percent uh, less uh, hospitalization in the BCG group compared to placebo. Very important to say, not statistically significant at this moment yet. Also, we have seen very interestingly fifty five percent diagnosis of influenza infection. Again, important to say, not, uh, not, uh, not yet significant. So these are just tendency. I'm just showing them uh, to you, but with this important uh, disclosure that these are not statistically significant yet, but what it tells us, it is important to follow them up in, uh, uh, further. And that is why we uh, got the approval from the ethical committee to follow, to follow up uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the patients, uh, no, not the patients, the volunteers, um, uh, for, for another year, and uh, fortunately we'll know in the summer what was happening actually in the last year. And as you can see here, it seems actually that the effect of BCG on influenza is stronger. And that is actually the same what we have seen at the, uh, at the cellular level. It seems that the cellular response against influenza virus is also better. So actually I'm just one uh, to show you in between, we have done also a, uh, an experimental study in the mice with BCG, and we observed the same thing. Uh, basically, the protection against influenza was much stronger than the protection against, uh, against COVID-19, which we, uh, this study was recently reported. And this is very interesting and something that we are working on to try to understand what are the differences in pathophysiology that explains this difference. But that being said, we did see a tendency for, uh, for uh, maybe some, uh, some less severity in, in our elderly uh, with, uh, with comorbidities. And mortality was also 30% less. But again, it was not statistically significant because of the low numbers. You can see it here. But then together with Peter, this, uh, this table is actually kindly uh, provided by, uh, by Peter Arby. We put together all the data from the uh, from the BCG studies that were uh, published or presented out until now. I think some of them will be presented today. And if we just uh, just perform the uh, the analysis of all these data together, we do observe that there seems to be uh, a forty percent less mortality in the BCG groups. But again, this is done. Um, uh, uh, this, uh, for none of these uh, studies, the uh, significance is attained. So, uh, so more studies are needed and more follow up in the, uh, in the trials already ongoing. But of course, we hope that larger trials, uh, uh, especially the trial of Nigel Curtis from Australia, will give us more information about, about uh, severity. All in all, what we can conclude from the, from the Dutch studies is that BCG vaccination did not protect against the total number of COVID-19 infections in a Northern European country, which was not vaccinated at birth. The BCG seems to improve the serological response against SARS-CoV-2 and possibly also against uh, uh, after the vaccination, as we have seen in the Mexican study. And I actually do know that there is another beautiful study done by colleagues in the UK and, um, and, and India who showed precisely the same thing for the combination of BCG with AstraZeneca vac vaccine. So it seems that 
that BCG truly can uh, can boost the response against uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 induced by the specific vaccines. And this can be very important because the quality of the response and the duration of the response is one of the weaknesses of the current vaccines. Um, we cannot exclude yet, but also cannot be sure about effects on severity. So more studies are needed there. We are follow, uh, following up our, uh, our 8,000 elderly now for another year to see whether we can attain more information about severity, but we cannot exclude such an information. And very interestingly, something that we are working also is the, that the effects of BCG vaccination on influenza and COVID-19 seem to differ. And it seems that the effects on influenza are stronger. All in all, this could be after we learn much more in the coming years, hopefully that this research would go on, that, that maybe live attenuated vaccines that can induce strain immunity, uh, heterologous responses might be used as a breach vaccination in, in, in case of a new pathogen until implementation of specific vaccines. And with that, I would like, of course, to thank all the colleagues of us who helped us and collaborated with us uh, during the years, and also especially during the last uh, two years of the pandemic. And uh, thank you for attention. Thank you so much, Mihai. It's a pity we cannot hear the applause here in this webinar because it was a truly beautiful presentation. Yeah, we will clap here yeah, of, of an enormous undertaking during these uh, last two years and, and so many thrilling insights coming out of, of what you have done. Since there are no uh, active questions in the q and I'll permit myself uh, the time to ask you uh, maybe actually two short questions. What do you think are the mechanisms underlying the increased serological response if it's not an increased uh, innate response and and do you are you aware of studies following up on people who got bcg and then were covid vaccinated versus placebo and then covid vaccinated for their actual specific protection against covid-19 does it have clinical implications yeah that's that's an excellent question. I, I do think even if there is no uh, even if there is no direct uh, uh, direct effect let's say on, on the total number uh, of infections because maybe the, uh, the innate immune responses were not uh, strongly enough induced in innate immune cells. I do think that the possibil possibility exists and most likely is that antigen presentation uh, uh, capacities of the immune, uh, innate immune cells are improved by, by BCG. So at the moment that it encounters the virus or the vaccine, there is better antigen presentation, activation of T cell, but also B cell responses. And that is responsible for the, the improved serological response. Uh, regarding also the, uh, um, uh, the, the second part of your question, whether BCG vaccinated individuals who receive there after a specific vaccine, might they be better protective for a longer period? That is also an excellent question. As far as I know, there is not directly a study design uh, like that, but hopefully in our study, for example, that we are following up now uh, for the second part of, the, of, of, of our uh, BCG prime and BCG elderly study in the Netherlands, uh, the vast majority of, of the volunteers now will have received actually a specific vaccine and they were randomized for BCG. So we will be able probably to respond this question uh, in the summer. Thank you very much. I have a brief comment from Evangelos who would like to ask yes. you a question. Uh, well, hello, good morning. Uh, I would like to address a question. And uh, we have plenty of uh, several times in our uh, private discussions uh, raised uh, how is it possible that we have positive results of BCG vaccination in the Greek population and not uh, in the Dutch population. And uh, actually I was wondering, and this is something that we have not uh, discussed in our uh, private uh, chats that we had. Uh, could it be the case, the explanation or part of the explanation that uh, the Greek study population were not physicians, whereas uh, enrolling in this type of trials physicians, although they are at greater risk for infection, is not probably the correct one because they are continuously being trained, trained from bacteria because they are exposed or, or viruses because they are exposed to respiratory infections since they have started being residents uh, in the wards. 
Well, this is this could be an explanation, for example, why we didn't observe it in the other study that I didn't present to you because it was a little bit smaller, but with precisely the same conclusion in the healthcare professionals. But the two studies that I presented, actually, they are just elderly with all kinds of uh, occupations. So they were not specially, uh, specially, uh, let's say, healthcare uh, uh, providers. So that is unlikely to, to explain this difference. I, I would think that well, we don't know, basically, differences in the population exposure and so on. So we, we have to see what it is. In any case, in the Netherlands and probably in Northern Europe, because we discussed a little bit with Christina and Peter about that, but in the Northern Europe, um, I, I truly see very clearly that in terms of the total number of infections, BCG has no effect. Um, um, the other question, however, which is very important and we are following it up, even if it doesn't have an effect on the total number of infection, does it help for severity, mortality, and so on? So I think that's where uh, we would need to, to focus uh, during this year. We'll be talking much more about the reasons for the heterogeneous results in the panel discussion. So uh, in the interest of time and to follow our program, I'll cut the discussion short here. Other questions, remaining questions, please refer them to the Q&A and we'll do our best to, to tackle them 